On this one, isn't there an advantage to you all, though, to look at more of the analytes so that if you find, st as long as you're in there testing, you find what's there, that also helps insulate you later on, as much as finding stuff from well stimulation would be an issue that you needed to resolve and follow up on, right? Um, you know, Peter, I want to I let you answer this question about some of the geology and what you find down there. So uh, it's a good question. Um, I think that from, from a baseline perspective, that makes good sense. Um, but going forward for the regular semi-annual as proposed in the regulation sampling, um, we believe that it makes more sense to focus on a targeted list. And then if that targeted list indicates some kind of changes that may be indicative of uh, impacts, then that list would naturally be then expanded uh, to compare the baseline conditions to the post-injection conditions. And I think some of the other things is that there's analytes in that list that are, that are naturally occurring in groundwater before, our, before we have a presence in terms of hydraulic fracturing. Um, and some of those, um, and what we've been told by our experts is that sometimes those analytes will fluctuate over time, uh, simply because groundwater is, you know, it, it's not a pool, it's a moving, you know, source of water. So we just think looking at analytes that aren't necessarily directly associated with WST is, or, and having an, ups, an upgrading monitoring well doesn't seem to make a lot of sense for us if we're looking to determine what the impacts of WST are on protected water. And, and on that point, um, will you be furnishing that in your comments, um, a suggested sort of framework for Certainly. indicator parameters and then, and then and how they're nested within this proposed network that staff has. Right, we'll be submitting, you know, fairly extensive comments on, on the, uh, the draft monitoring regulations for your staff's review. And we've been taking notes on some of the things that staff have recommended that we incorporate in our comments, and so we'll be doing that. One point that you made about the upgradient well, I, I think to circle back to that, it's it's a reasonable comment, you know, in terms of pre-project stimulation in one well versus you know post or you know pre-stimulation versus post-stimulation data collection. So I I hear that point, but isn't it wouldn't that be kind of uh, challenging in, in an area where there's a lot of historic um, you know oil development um, where your uh, pre-stimulation may have been affected by other activities that, uh, you know, and then by having an upgradient well, you can control for those factors that could otherwise blur the data. So when you say pre stimulation you mean? So your proposal was to do away with an upgradient well, because that's kind of your classic, you know, underground tank leak type setup. Correct. But, and then I thought your point was, you know, worth exploring more that you could have your down gradient well pre-stimulation data, and then you would uh, evaluate the effects of the stimulation you know, after the fact. But aren't, wouldn't you be confronted by some challenges by having that pre-stimulation data be affected by other oil and gas development activities that had preceded the well stimulation that's proposed? I think I see your point. I'm just not sure where the upgradient well solves that problem. If it's upgrading of oil and gas activities, it could solve that problem. Oh, so if it's upgrading of, uh, because when you look at some of these well fields, they are extensive. Um, they have, they're, they're doing a lot of exploration and a lot of production in these well fields. And so our thought is, well, if you're going to test the ground, excuse me, if you're going to test the groundwater prior to the groundwater that's within that half mile downstream of your fr hydraulic fracturing well is going to be represented. And if there's a change there, then you're going to see if there's a, um, you're going to have, since it's downgrading of the hydraulic fracturing well, you're going to see that. So that's why we just didn't, it just didn't seem to make sense with us. Um, you know, maybe we can talk a little bit more with you and staff afterward to kind of understand um, what you think the value would be there. I guess it's just not clear to me. Actually, Mr. Borgovich, if you could come back up, um, I asked him this question during my briefing, and I and he provided what I thought was a, a reasonable answer in terms of the value of an upgradient monitoring. Right. Well, I think that it um, 
the upgrading it well uh, comes into play when you're in an area especially where groundwater flow directions fluctuate, where there's localized pumping, that well actually uh, may serve in uh, capacity of potentially being either a cross grading or even a down gradient well at one point. Provides a better framework for evaluation. Right. It's almost like triangulating, mm -hmm. you know, by having the, having the three wells. And I think Mr. Bishop um, we talked about this earlier that this is sort of a standard way of um, measuring and monitoring. Um, could you provide more information about that? Other programs and, you know, the up gradient and down gradient. Right. Well, um, you know, for years underground storage tank cleanups have used a similar type of an approach. It's a first step for any type of an assessment. Uh, triangle serve, the triangle setup of the well serves as a means of being able to draw more accurate groundwater flow maps, uh, potential metric surfaces, et cetera, to get a better understanding of the groundwater conditions in the subsurface. Peter, did, uh, I'm hoping you could weigh in here. Absolutely. Uh, of course, we have to understand the direction of groundwater flow. I mean, that's, uh, that's a basis for uh, understanding where to place the downgrading and upgrading well. Of course, by calling an upgrade well, it assumes that we already know what the direction of groundwater flow is. Um, so it, it really comes down to understanding uh, the hydrogeology of the site. And it kind of speaks to having the flexibility or the, uh, the ability to look at the hydrogeology of the site, assess it based on whatever information is available. There may be wells in the, in the area, there may be water supply wells, there might be other wells that have been used for other purposes. Um, the way that we look at the, the, the criteria that are written as they are written now is that the uh, upgrading well would be required for each of these projects. But at some point, and perhaps even early on, the information will be sufficient to know which way the groundwater is moving. I think that's that's very important to know. But it doesn't mean that every single project should require an upgrade and well. Something I wanted to um, to mention also is the reference that was made to the UST uh, approach and other types of approaches for monitoring. Those are monitoring programs for releases. And I, I just want to clarify that when we talk about a WST, about a stimulation, that is not a release. The release occurs if the stimulation fluids leave the intended zone and go into a protected groundwater aquifer. So uh, the, the idea that this, a similar approach for what is used for known releases would apply here may or may not be correct, and it's something we definitely need to explore further in, in how these regulations are you know, going to shape up. Um, I, I also want to add one more thing, which is that um, the regulations speak to the um, uh, background, uh, to the upgrading well as also providing baseline conditions. Um, but um, I, I think, as Kevin stated, the downgrading wells are really the ones that are going to be held as the uh, as the, the the test of whether there is an impact or not. Um, so it's really the baseline conditions and the up and the downgrading wells that needs to be understood well prior to the stimulation because that's the direction of groundwater flow. So that's where if we, if we do see impacts, they would be in the downgrading wells. And the geology and hydrogeology can be quite complex. So the geochemical conditions, for instance, in the upgrading well may have little to do with the downgrading well, which might be a mile away. Um, so again, I, I would be hesitant to a priori assume that, uh, that information from that upgrading well could be used to define baseline. Well, couldn't the upgradient also protect you in the event that um, there is a change in the downgradient? In other words, there, if, without the upgradient, the change could be assumed to come from um, well operator activities. But if you had the upgradient and could show that that change also occurred in the upgradient area, then I would think that would be useful information for the well operator. I think it could be, but again, it, it's going to be very site-specific and case-specific and geology-specific. Um, it may or may not be relevant to that particular case. So I think it, it's something that we need to explore as to its applicability to each and every project, uh, the way that it seems to be implied in the regulations. I'd actually want to do the well right where you're doing the stimulation before you do the stimulation because then you'd have your site where you were. 
too. Are you referring to the stimulation wall itself? We're talking about it. Maybe it's too far up. up upgrading. Actually, what you just said made me think there just need to be more wells as opposed to fewer wells. So um, we should keep we should keep going and then really focus on it in your com I think in your comments it may become clearer to me. I, okay. Yeah, and I mean just to circle back to, to John, it, I think what this discussion shows is that going into a site like the 22 uh, monitoring programs you've done under the interim regulations, you don't have a set knowledge of things like where, what direction gradient is necessarily. There, you'll have an educated guess uh, on that and you'll develop a program based on a presumed up gradient and down gradient. But really, it, until you collect data, you don't know for certain. And that's why three wells is a conservative. Right, and that's the challenge uh, during the interim period is that we really still haven't gotten the, um, you know, the wealth of information that you would need to be able to make an assertion that um, X number of wells are going to be sufficient versus Y number of wells. But it does speak to the, you know, um, your uh, point about having flexibility and, and look at site-specific monitoring design. And I think, you know, I'm, it's my impression from your presentation earlier that's it. the intent is there has to be flexibility and staff understands that. Thank you. Um, we spoke of earlier about hydrocarbon bearing zones. Right now in the, in the criteria of protected water, there's, I think it's on page two, it talks about what uh, an exempted aquifer, um, not as one of the criteria that if it's an exempted aquifer, then there's no monitoring required. Um, and part of the issue with that is if you find that you have water nearby that's hydrocarbon bearing, we don't think that that would be suitable for the definition of protected water because you're not going to be able to drink it. And, so, and I know I've asked you this before and I just don't remember the answer. So you're saying if it if you had hydrocarbon presence in the zone, you'd automatically be above ten thousand or below ten thousand. You'd be you'd automatically be above ten thousand TDS anyway. Or you're just saying quite apart from that, if there's hydrocarbons, you're not going to be able to treat it and have it be usable in the foreseeable future. Well, the three criteria are if it's below ten thousand, two hundred gallons per day, or an exempted aquifer. Um, our position is is that. If it's got hydro, if it's got hydrocarbons in it, then in our minds, it, it's difficult for us to believe that this could be protected water for use for for drinking or agriculture because it is hydrocarbon bearing, and you know our members typically develop those air, rare areas. I mean, one of the issues that you know I've learned in this process is that when we go and do develop, our members go and do development for every one gallon of oil, they get like 10 gallons of water, and it's, of course, it's full of hydrocarbon, part of their EOR program. So one of the things that we thought would be appropriate is if you're looking in an area and the, and what, and the area has hydrocarbons in it, we just don't see how that could be considered protected water. John, uh, help me here. Uh, Los Angeles is full of hydrocarbon bearing water that gets pumped and treated. Uh, I assume it's low, low, t lower TDS than ten thousand or anything like that. But uh, right, there's what is there, it? There, there's some. Um, you know. like we're speaking a different language, so right. bear right. with us because we're trying to understand what you're saying, which right. you seems obvious to you, but it's actually not obvious to a regular person. Okay, so I think that um, the you know what the USGS has done citing information with respect to, uh, let's say, the east side of uh, the San Joaquin Valley near the Bakersfield area, there's uh, shallower wells, uh, and they uh, also have uh, fresher water in it. And some of those formations on, uh, in those areas, uh, as you step away from the oil field, actually are supplying have groundwater wells in them that serve you know, good water. So uh, it depends upon how you uh, draw the line. And I think that what we've made um, an attempt at being clear uh, that if the, um, if the proposed well stimulation well penetrates a zone that's exempt under UIC, um, then that would be one of the criteria to consider them not, being, not having to do a groundwater monitoring plan. But um, uh, part of that 
revolves around that the exempted aquifer status uh, also uh, is whether or not it's uh, petroleum hydrocarbon bearing based upon the uh, 73, 74 um, re um, report that identified those areas of the state where petroleum bearing uh, hydrocarbons were in those zones. And that being said, uh, the Tulare Formation is an example of where there are hydrocarbons in the Tulare Formation, but there are also areas of the Tulare Formation that do not have hydrocarbons in it that serve beneficial use water. So it sounds like what I think Mr. Borkovich is saying is that even though there may be hydrocarbon bearing groundwater nearby, the groundwater that's being used for drinking is not hydrocarbon bearing. So I actually think we're in kind of an agreement then. Um, we, we just, I mean, I, I think we could talk more with staff about, you know, how we could resolve that. But we, we just believe if it's a hydrocarbon bearing zone, then you can't really designate it as protected water. So. I know we just need to spend time on this because I know the definition of protected water comes from EPA originally, right? And so that, that's right. So I think that novel. first that first bullet where it appears to require formal exemption, I mean, that's one of the three. So the other one is if it's above 10,000 ppm TDS or if the uh, aquifer doesn't yield um, more than 200 gallons per day, uh, those are two other two out of the three. So uh, either one of those three would be uh, potentially a means of being able to request for that written concurrence of being excluded to not do a groundwater monitoring plan. Okay, thank you. Um, and then I think um, just finishing up some of our technical content here is we talked a little bit about regulatory process. Um, we'd be very interested in if the board or staff could tell us if there's any type of time frames that our members could uh, at least as a rule of thumb, get an idea about how long it would take for them to be able to go through the regulatory process. I know that the board is very busy right now with a lot with the drought priorities and everything, and we 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 want to be understanding in that. But that would be tremendously helpful for us. In the review for each of the yes right <clears throat> stimulation, so that you all have a sense of what we're shooting for with the staff we have. Well, and I think um, I'm not sure if you're going to be getting uh, more funding for staff on this program. I, I, I'm, I'm not, I don't follow things in the legislature, but I think you got a budget, um, a BCP. Um, so we, we would just be interested if, you know, the state board is going to be staffing up, which this program is going to require. We would be able to have an idea from staff and from the board how long our members would be looking at in terms, you know, at least something that gives them an idea. So in summary, I mean, this is kind of our, our, our slides up front. We, we should be, we think it should be based on sound science. We think the fact that we have to put one up gradient, two down gradient monitoring wells for every aquifer we penetrate, um, even though it's a solid pipe going through the well and we've we've established a, a sound history of well integrity with our members, um, we don't think that really is supported by sound science that we should have to do that. Um, we think our operators would like to be able to have the option of proposing an alternative plan if they think they have a better idea to be able to protect protected water from WST components. We talked a little bit about the analyte list being relevant indicators. Um, we talked about excluding hydrocarbon bearing zones and the and the process. Uh, we just wanted to finish up with saying, you know, we really appreciate staff meeting with us and working with us. This is an incredibly difficult project to achieve in the time frames that everybody has been saddled with. And and so we appreciate that. We'll continue to work with the board and with staff to bring your regulatory program to fruition. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your engagement as well. Thank you. This has been very helpful to give us the framing before the comments come in. So I, I really appreciate you setting up the uh, workshop. That I like this model. So thank you. Whether you just do it as a matter of course or someone suggested it, it's I appreciate it. Um, we do have one speaker card. So I wanted to give that person an opportunity. And that would be uh, Olivia Regalia from the Sierra Club.
afternoon, maybe. Um, just a brief comment. Um, Chair, members of the board, Olivia Regalia on behalf of Seria Club California. Uh, we just wanted to let you know that we support strong monitoring and reporting requirements for fracking operations in California. Um, we believe that oil extraction should not take precedence over current and future water needs of the public. And the board needs to ensure that all aquifers that could potentially be used for ben used beneficially are protected from fracking's harmful effects. Thank you. Thank you. We have another card. Okay. Mr. Alio. Great. Bill Alio. Bill Alio uh, with the Environmental Working Group. Um, I want to echo what Mr. Grimberg's comments were. I know he kind of took the liberty of expanding beyond just SB4, but it's really hard not to when you're seeing you know, a hole punched in the ground and there's pre drill there's the drilling, then the well stem, and then things happen. And where the flow back from that well stem becomes part of the produced water and that has to be disposed of. So you can't put blinders on and go, it's just a two hour thing. Also, um, oh, I wanted to back out a little bit and thank the staff and the Lawrence people and the USGS for doing a great job on putting all this together and inviting public testimony I'm gonna and I'm going to call them the Lawrence people from now on. Uh, for uh, having us uh, participate in, in helping to develop it, but they're the experts. You know, we were just slightly helpful, I think. Um, and then on what it seems to me, what you're asking, the I think it was uh, Madam Chair asking the right question of WISPA, are they implying that, look, we're doing real-time monitoring of well casing, so if a well casing failure happens, we'll know we shut down the well, so that's it. We've, mon in effect, monitored. I'm not sure what they're saying, but moreover, uh, one thing we found out in the last four years of looking at Dogger, there's no data on well casing failures. So when I asked them about that, they said, we don't keep that. That'd be a good idea of a database. And I suggested by chronologically, by operator, by geologic formation, by county, so that we could should have been able to see since 1970 or whatever, who's doing the worst job at this? And is it by formation? I know they've had well casing failures due to subsidence and maybe by geo, um, or faulting. So there are no numbers on that. So they're saying, trust us on this. And I was saying to Dr. Bowen the other day, in effect, we're probably not worse off than we are because the, the industry practices good engineering, you know, has good engineering practices and aren't blowing out wells left and right. So they're doing a decent job, we know that, but how good of a job, we don't. So therefore, the comprehensive look at water quality monitoring, I think is essential to give us a much better idea of what's going on. We know that Dogger didn't do a great job the last 100 years. It's their 100-year anniversary. And they're reformating, reformulating themselves right now. We're recasting Dogger before our very eyes the last few years through budget, through laws. And I think, well, uh, water quality monitoring is part of that recasting, and it should be comprehensive as broad as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, one more speaker card. Uh, Brian Nowicki from the Center for Biological Diversity. Good morning. Very much. Um, actually had just a couple of questions I was hoping I could pose to the, to the board and staff. And um, one of them has to do with the uh, definition used in the proposed rule, the draft rule, um, for protected waters. And that is, the second criteria says able to yield more than 200 gallons a day. Um, what does that mean? It means it's, it's modeled to be able to yield. It means that it is yielding. Is there, um, is there a technical definition for that that, that isn't obvious when, um, when we're reading the rule? Turn to John. I think that's a good question. And my understanding is that the requirement would be that a technical analysis would need to be done, something on the order of a aquifer test, uh, aka a pump test, to demonstrate. Uh, it would, I think, pretty quickly go, the well would go dry if you used a well point that was only producing 200 gallons per day. Uh, so it would be a sustained test. There's parameters associated with doing aquifer testing, and it would need to be reported to the board in their submittal for written concurrence. That might be more complicated than the question. Let me try it another way. If it only yields less than 200 gallons per day, that means it's not a very active well that's likely to that's be correct. used for drinking water. That would just would be inadequate as a well. Yes, and that's taken from EPA guidance, correct? Yeah. And protected water, I can try, but you'll do a better job of explaining what that comes from. 
Uh, protective water, uh, we derive that from um, the uh, EPA guidance for 40 CFR 146 revolving around UIC and that the 10,000 threshold uh, is, is established that if an injection project uh, is proposed, uh, if it's at the waters, the existing uh, uh, waters that are in the subsurface are above 10,000 uh, parts per million total dissolved solids, then uh, that's a parameter that's used to uh, move forward with not having to get an aquifer exemption under um, the Safe Drinking Water Act. And I think the principal reason for it is just that it's so, there's so much schmutz in it that it's not likely to be used anytime soon for drinking water. You'd be cleaning other stuff up first. You know, and it, it pushes the, some people would argue that's too high because something much lower is still unlikely to be used in the short term, but the protected water is a, a protected sort of category that tries to take a longer term view both of our need for water and our ability to treat it. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. I had just one other um, point that I don't know if it's a question or something that it, that we just need to um, include, definitely be including in our comments, but you might be able to give me an easier response right now. And that is, um, r right now under SB4, we are going to be uh, getting more disclosure of the actual, um, the constituents of the fracking fluid itself, um, the chemical identities. But what we aren't necessarily explicitly requiring under SB4 is still the chemicals used for the, gra the gravel packing, the well maintenance and drilling fluids um, that are associated with those. Are you, um, so when I'm looking at the criteria or the um, specific analyte list and, the, and also the requirement to say, you know, uh, identify all these up front so that when we see changes in these um, various identified criteria that we'd be able to go back and check for these are we um, contemplating a way to capture those and those other chemicals that aren't explicitly required under SB4 for uh, gravel packing, well maintenance, and drilling fluids? I think that's a good question. We could um, talk with our experts about that, exploring, you know, expanding. Because the, the thinking potential. is that you're going to have indicators of that well causing something, as opposed to having to check for every single thing that might be in that well. It's a it, it, basic indicator. Look, even though you have seven, seventy something or however many is on your list. Okay. Thank you very much, and thank you to the board and staff for your work on this. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Are there other questions at the moment? Well, uh, let me just thank you well, all. I, I just I have one uh, question, or not not question, but one uh, request is uh, to uh, bring us all up to speed at some point. Not not now. Uh, on the MOU with Dogger and also the other MOUs, which I really didn't know about, um, that Dogger is, is going to be, I see that he's gone, so I, I would ask him if he were here, uh, how, you know, what, what is the status of those MOUs? And um, so when, when should we start to see something from those? Not just with us, but with other uh, Cali PA agencies. Right. Well, um, Dogger was required to have the MOA in place with uh, us as of the first of this year. So there was a, um, I think, a, prior to it becoming public, uh, it was made available um, for comment. Um, but uh, that was around the first of the year. So um, like with it, a lot of things within SB4, there are some very short timelines associated with it. But that MOA reflects our uh, relationship between uh, Dogger and the water boards with respect to uh, working on the uh, groundwater monitoring plans that are submitted by the uh, oil well operators. But, but what about the ones with DTSC and OEHA and I don't know. You'd have to ask them. I okay. don't know what the status I, of those. I would just. I, I, can you I, pass that along to, sure, to I will. the Dogger I'll folks? And, and I'd, I'd appreciate knowing more. And I'm sorry, I totally blanked out on our MOA. So I'm glad it's up to date. Yeah, uh, just real quickly, I, I just encourage you to, as we talked about in the briefing, to to look at how we we frame the the minimum requirements for the model criteria, because I think there's been some confusion you know, is how we worded it, saying, oh, at a minimum, you need to have the three wells. Really, it's that's a default, or there's some other, you know, maybe there's another word we can use. 
um, but that the the model criteria will be adapted to site specific circumstances to get okay. cost effective and meaningful monitoring information. Right. Okay. And also, I'm I'm always interested in exploring efficiencies on on indicators. You know, I, I maybe the 78 analytes you know makes sense for a lot of reasons, but. I want to explore um, efficiencies in terms of the monitoring list, and I, I support the idea of a kind of a telescoped process where you have indicators, and then if they're triggered, you go into more detail. I, I think there's a lot of logic to that approach. That's just me. Thanks. Other questions? Well, thank you. Um, thanks for the good work, but also thank you, those that, of you that spoke for the framing. That totally helps us. Uh, get ready for our briefings and to receive your comments. So thank you very much. All right. At this point, we're on to item number seven, which would be board member reports. Which side wants to start? Can we start with me, since I have just one really short item. Mr. Laufer? Yeah, if I, I can just ask the board one question is before we go into this item and the board member reports. We do have a closed session set for today. And just oh. so I can have staff ready, uh, would you prefer to take your lunch before it? Would you like to go to the closed session and then go take your lunches? Or would you like to do a combined lunch and closed session at noon? Uh, I wouldn't mind combining the two. I need to take a break to talk with somebody about water rights. So I, I won't take that. Well, I think maybe we break it if you want. I'm mean, looking at everybody. We could break at noon and grab food and then come back at 12.15. Okay. Does that work for the board? Then I will Unless have staff I'm... in the closed session room at 12.15. So my one item is just to, to uh, let the other board members aware uh, no, because I've already talked to Mr. Howard and Mr. Laufer regarding this. It's regarding the toxicity amendments. At the last San Francisco Bay Regional Water Board meeting, there was a, a permit in front of them. I guess I won't go into detail in case it's, it's uh, petitioned to us, but the, the focus of the discussion was on the issue of toxicity, um, specifically the, 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 the uh, numeric limits um, and U.S. EPA's uh, uh, interest in that permit as well as other permits involving the issue of toxicity. And one of the things that uh, came up repeatedly during the board's lengthy discussion um, was that there's this, this, there has been this period of uncertainty while awaiting the state board action on the toxicity amendments. And I know it has not been something that, at least for me, I've been pushing staff on in terms of a priority. But having sat through uh, that discussion at the Regional Water Board and hearing how, I guess, in 2004, the State Board then committed to conduct that toxicity amendments within one year, and here we are in 2015, uh, it was slightly uncomfortable to be there uh, listening to that and, and to listen to how the Regional Board members really struggled with this issue in the face of lack of guidance uh, from the State Board. After that meeting, I talked with Mr. Howard and Mr. Laufer, and it was, um, I guess, it's my take, and I, I will just share it with the rest of you, that I've asked staff to move quickly um, on this matter and bring the item to the board as soon as possible. I know that they have been trying to work with US EPA to work out some areas of disagreements, specifically on legal issues, um, but I, you know, it's been long enough. And so again, my, my request to staff, my very strong request to staff is get it to the board, um, you know, certainly outline whatever areas of, of uh, uncertainty that remains, um, seeking the board's direction, but let us consider it and let us move on and let's stop this, this uncertain period that's just been in flux for way too long. I, I assume you noticed in the uh, executive director's report it's on hold. Yes, it's been on hold for quite a while. But it's no longer on hold, Mr. Laufer, Mr. Howard? Actually, I was going to make that correction uh, in a couple of minutes when I gave the executive director's report that it isn't on hold any longer. But uh, I guess But I've since you're that. here, so what is our projected timing now on it? 
I will send an email to the board members later today with that information. But it will be soon? It will be as soon as it can be. Soon. Okay. <laughs> How about your field trip? I guess for the you know for the minutes. <laughs> Last week I uh, traveled to the Santa Ana region um, where Dee Dee is the uh, uh, liaison, but just just to immerse myself and, and learn the issues there. So uh, I met with the regional board for a morning and toured many facilities, um, too many to count really, <laughs> and uh, but it, it was. It was really useful. Learned a lot about efforts and conservation that are underway down there. And I guess my highlight for me was the uh, Riverside Public Works demonstration uh, LID um, parking lot. And they're all set up to collect some excellent science on the benefits of LID versus traditional paving and that sort of thing. Uh, they just haven't had any storms of significant size since they built it two and a half years ago <laughs> to collect the data. Uh, but that's a real exemplary site. Um, and then on Friday, I was a presenter at the Napa Watershed Symposium, uh, where we talked about um, there they had a successful measure A that helped with um, many watershed expenditures, meeting TMDL requirements of the regional board. Um, and doing lots of river restoration, and um, so that's been a successful project uh, and, and a program. That's going to sunset, so there was a discussion about how do we keep funding watershed protection and improvement programs in the Napa setting. And so I was on a panel with folks, you know, um, including Mitch Avalon from Contra Costa County, who uh, is spearheading some Prop 218 reform, working with our, the governor's office, um, and uh, Harry Saradarian was the panel um, leader, and he's head of the North Bay Watershed Association. And so those are a couple of highlights recently. It's been a busy couple of months. Maybe Board Member Diadamo can report on our efforts to work with the Russian River um, folks on um, preserving the coho through this summer and in, in voluntary drought initiative agreements. Uh, I will focus on uh, one. Uh, well, actually, it was it was one divided into two parts. Um, I went to the uh, drought summit that the regional water board in San Diego held, and it was uh, Agita was the um, the uh, facilitator for it. I'm guessing there were somewhere between 75 and 100 people. The energy level was at the highest I could possibly have imagined. And people were very positive, very very eager to have been asked to come in. And the question that they were asked to uh, address was what can the regional water board do to help with the drought? Now, the, there'll be a report coming out, and I haven't seen what the report is. But just the the holding of that at the regional board um, was was very positive in that region. I mentioned it to Region Seven in Colorado River region, and they're considering doing something similar. And uh, so I I, I had uh, communicated this with uh, with uh, Tom Howard uh, that uh, as we develop these these state issues and as we do things that have a that where where the state really is uh, it, it, uh, setting the the standards we we need to uh, make better use or um, make use sometimes of uh, of the talent that we've got at the regional level to help disseminate what we're doing and to get information back at, for uh, based on what we're doing and also to, to engage the regions more in, in what, uh, what is happening here so that they don't feel separate from, but feel a part of. And so I just wanted to um, pass that along. And I, I think it's, it's something that we all can, can work on. WQCC is going to be taking place in October uh, 12th and 13th. 
And uh, so that'll, I suspect that that will be a, a piece of the theme of the whole WQCC. How can the regions, and I would say the drinking water regions as well, be more a part of what we do? Before you proceed, can I follow up and ask the vice chair a question? I think it has to do with that, uh, that uh, gathering you had, but I, I read somewhere that the San Diego Regional Water Board, at least at the staff level, is interested in following up on one of my favorite topics, and the chair is least a favorite, and that is the issue of prohibiting uh, wastewater discharge into the ocean. Did that item come up during that, this meeting? They had tables, and it did not come up at either table, but I was at a finance table, and I was at a, an other water supply table. So it could have come up in, in other. I think I might have read that in the executive director's report, one of the appendices that we, well, anyway, I will, f I will find out where I read that from and perhaps follow up with Region 9 directly, with your permission, of course. That's really, I just want to confirm, um, Fran, that, you know, the, the regions that I participate in more actively, it is, that's, these regional boards are a great forum for public interaction and input, and, um, and it's certainly a strength of our system uh, that we can use to help communicate with the public um, in a place where we can hear from them in a decentralized manner. Thank you. I agree. I was at Region 8 and uh, gave an update on our emergency uh, regulations, the urban regulations, and um, we had a very lively, engaged discussion, and afterwards a couple of board members came up to me and said, this was the most interesting meeting I've been at in a while. They were very much interested in learning more about, you know, the specifics, because we do it all the time, and, uh, but going through it, it is a little confusing. So I would encourage a coordinated effort. Um, I've been to a couple of um, uh, climate change workshops that Region 6 hosted, and I think all the regions have, you know, a quick, easy set of folks, stakeholders that they could get in touch with. And uh, at those workshops, we had that similar to what you, uh, it sounds like you were involved in tables that spread out. And at the table that I sat at, um, most of the uh, GHG reduction recommendations centered around water use efficiency. So I think that it would fit in nicely. Um, I, I just had a, a couple of things. One is um, on compost, um, and um, I think Mr. Howard has a, an announcement to make about um, the hearing, the adoption hearing uh, coming up in June, uh, probably a workshop instead. And um, I think that uh, that would be very helpful because there's uh, some you know, ongoing uh, dialogue um, with the um, regulated parties and then also a concern, I think a legitimate concern about um, uh, the, state, the state's um, uh, Cal Recycles uh, diversion goals and the concern that, you know, this not um, interfere with the diversion goals and with healthy soils really underway, um, I think a workshop discussion uh, would be a good opportunity to kind of look at the big picture uh, before we move into adoption. Do you have anything to add, Mr. Howard? Yeah, I just, I just mentioned that um, as board member Diadamo said, we are going to hold a workshop on the 16th. The subject of the workshop will be not only the permit itself to see if we we're going to be seeking direction from the board as to whether they want us to move forward in the next few weeks with bringing it to you for adoption, but also the issue that is, uh, I understand, of concern to CalRecycle, and that's the entire uh, uh, organics waste stream and its management and what we should be doing working with them to make sure that we are properly managing that waste stream. They're concerned about land disposal and the implications of, uh, you know, increasing requirements for composting and how that might result in more land disposal. And of course, from our perspective, land disposal, at least the kind of land disposal they're referring to, is illegal in the first place and would require a report of waste discharge from us and subject to regulation. So, you know, but of course we have the, you know, the confounding factor of people managing it illegally, uh, potentially, due to uh, the ease of doing that. So, so we have to see if we can work through that issue. 
And then on the drought initiative, Russian River Board Member Moore and I have been working with uh, Mr. Howard. We had a good discussion with Chuck Bonham yesterday, and there's um, there are a lot of good things going on on the ground. Um, uh, there is a, a real possibility that we will have to. Uh, come in as a board and maybe uh, do a little bit more, but there are some meetings coming up, so we will know, um, I think by the time we get together again, I think we'll probably have a better sense of what all can be accomplished from a voluntary perspective versus, you know, anything more that needs to be done. Um, I mentioned earlier uh, complimenting staff and their work on curtailments. I did want to just um, also give a kudos to uh, Michael George. Um, I've been uh, working with him a lot. Um, he's doing these round-the-clock discussions on curtailments and also uh, other creative approaches, and hopefully you all will be hearing about um, uh, those um, uh, possibilities a little bit more tomorrow at the workshop. For spending the time on all of that, I, I the, the only thing I'll mention is um, it's been interesting to spend an, an awful lot of time in the rollout of our conservation regs, and I've been meeting with a lot of elected officials at the local level, a number of different groupings of mayors, both the governors and one that the mayor of L.A. pulled together with uh, mayors in L.A. County, um, spent a Saturday with elected officials from the 18 water districts, but all, uh, 16, 15 water districts, but also uh, elected city council members of the cities in um, the Santa Clara Valley. And that one was fascinating in particular because they were coming together to do a lot more than we were requiring of them because they're so concerned about their groundwater basin. So I was there more as a cheerleader because they've already saved enough that our regs don't require them to do that much more. And there was no um, concern or pushback at all. They were focused on how do they align their messaging and their programs so that their customers aren't confused across neighborhood lines. And so just to let you know, it was because we, at, at our hearings, the people who tend to be grumpy with us show up and or have legitimate, I'm not saying they don't have legitimate concerns, but there are all those people who don't show up because they're either with us or thankful. And I've gotten a lot of uh, appreciation and spoke at Aqua uh, as well. And then Thursday night, I'm speaking with a number of elected officials from this area. And so I'll fill you in on that as well. So that's been the the tour I've been on and along along with other things. So it's been interesting. All right. Executive Director's report. I just wanted to follow up a little more with what uh, Board Member Moore and uh, Board Member Diadamo said regarding Russian River. Uh, the staff are putting together briefings for all the board members. Uh, presently, we are proposing two sets of emergency regulations to bring before the board on June 16th. One would be an information order for all people taking water in the watershed, and the second would be a conservation regulation. Uh, and uh, my understanding is that in many cases the problems in those four watersheds in question is, or at least a portion of it, is due to uh, you know, rural residential and, you know, the water use associated with that. And uh, so it seemed, and they, of course, don't fall within any of the uh, regulations that the board's adopted. So, uh, you know, we'll see whether or not the board's interested in looking into that issue a little more. Uh, the four watersheds, by the way, are uh, Green Valley Creek, Mark West Creek, Mill Creek, and Dutch Bill Creek. And uh, these are four coho streams that are very important in the area. And one of those streams, the Mark West Creek, is one that we committed to try to provide. Uh, you know, it was listed on our five tributaries that we were going to be looking at uh, as part of the water action plan for setting flow objectives. However, a confounding factor on that that we need to all be concerned about is, or aware of is that it's also a sigma basin, unlike the remaining ones. And the problem is probably principally groundwater driven. So we have potentially, you know, intersecting laws and policies here that we need to be keep in mind as we consider moving forward with the work in that area. Um, <clears throat> uh, just briefly mention that the May revise came out on May 14th and we had, uh, there's some proposed trailer bill language that uh, we are uh, still working with with the administration in a number of areas, and uh, uh, also uh, an increased 
a substantial increase in our bond allocations. The administration wants to move those forward as much as possible. So, um, you know, quite a substantial increase there. Plus, uh, the Bay Delta program had a proposal in front of, uh, in there for 16 positions and a budget of almost $8 million. Uh, and of course, we're hoping that we get that approved through the budget process. And, and that's it for now. One thing I noticed uh, in the salt nutrient planning, and I see that Shala is still here, um, I, there's been an extension, large, uh, you know, uh, from, from some of the regions, uh, including the, uh, Region 5, which has the biggest one. Um, some have been completed, some have been extended. But my question is, how are those connecting um, are being how are they being used, or are they being used, those that have been completed, uh, in um, discussions about funding for groundwater? And I know we haven't let the money out the door yet, but um, you know, are those salt nutrient plans relevant to the to the funding uh, decisions that we're going to be making, and also to Sigma? I know it's not required in Sigma. But it does seem like it has a it has relevance, and so that's uh, I, I'm just trying to uh, um, chan maybe channel Camiar a little bit here uh, about looking at um, aligning our our various the various things that we do such that we get a better a bigger whole, and um, and so. I, I just in looking at the salt nutrient plans, lots of work has gone into that. A lot of funding from DWR uh, in their uh, their grant programs from the past uh, has has gone into there. We we really need to make sure that these things are working, and so that I'm just p uh, sending up a, a flag to. Um, to Shala, I've already sent an email to Shala, but uh, sending up a flag that we we need to get a, a kind of interim report on these and explore how these might get used, not only by us but by others. Yeah, uh, we, as you know, we need to adopt guidelines for that, and we'll be bringing those forward to the board for adoption. So you'll certainly have an opportunity, or you know, we'll have the opportunity to shape what the uses of that money are. Uh, I will point out your issues to Darren. It's the Division of Financial Assistance that will be preparing the guidelines. Uh, and so we'll see. We'll, we'll be talking with all the board members about it. But thank you. Other questions, comments? OK, with that, we will recess to close session. Can I ask for a few? Can we make it 12.20? So I have a little Maybe time to get food. Is 12.30 OK with the rest of you? OK, let's do 12.30. That just gives me, I need food. So great. Yeah. Oh, and then we'll reconvene tomorrow morning at the usual time to deal with our workshop on the variety of Bay Delta related items. Yeah, no, no, that's great. Yeah, thank you. He says thank you. He appreciates your support. Well, no, I'm sorry to make him wait. I. Tomorrow, that's the problem. The no. Senate's going to be coming on. What? Well, tomorrow. This is.